Good morning, everybody. All right, so uh, before we get started, there's just something that I had to say. Um, we were uh, in worship, and um, like it was our la the last song that they did, and um, it was kind of hot in here, right? Like it was burning up. <laughs> and um, so, how many people were praying for you know the AC to kick on? <laughs> But like, uh, but I guess they were singing the word. It says the atmosphere is changing now for the spirit of the Lord is here. How many people felt the AC come on when they said that? <laughs> I'm, I'm being for real. Like the AC legit came on, but we know that it wasn't just the AC, right? Like that was the spirit of the Lord. See, like the thing that God uh, has for me is that God is always really funny. You know, like he's just hilarious to me. So it's just like, it's funny to me that, you know, uh, while we're praying for his spirit to come, that that's the moment that the AC kicks on, right? But, um, but yeah, I just, I would almost say that, um, you know, the, the song says a miracle can happen now. I could say that all miracles can happen now when the spirit of the Lord is present. Um, so I just want to say that. Um, so... I, uh, back in January, the Lord hit me with, uh, you know, hey, you going to preach again? And so I was like, okay, what are we talking about? <laughs> and he, said, he told me Peter, and I was like, okay, well, um, what do you want to say about Peter? Because, you know, you know, there's a lot of things to know about Peter. And so I spent some time with him, and he said, Peter's special, and I want you to know why. So he gave this long list of scriptures to read about Peter. And there's one thing that separates Peter from all the other people in the Bible. You see, Abraham was known as a friend of God, and Jacob was known as a man who wrestled with God. David was a man after God's own heart, and uh, John is the disciple who Jesus loved. But I'm convinced that Peter is the man who loved Jesus. So I think it's interesting because... Um, you know, God's preparing me for this, and um, here it is where people are talking about, you know, relationships and reconciling. And so God told me that, hey, we need to be in a deeper relationship with him, and that, um, you know, we can be in a d deeper relationship with God as we love him, and to look at Peter's life as an example of what it means to love Jesus. So we're going to start in John 6. Um, John 6, verse 25. So I'm going to be reading from New King James Version. Um, a, lot of you people, a lot of people have NIV. Does anybody actually need a Bible? Everybody have one? Everybody have one that wants one? Okay. John 6. John chapter 6, verse 25. Okay, so um, while you're getting there, I'm just going to give a little um, background. So John 6 starts with the feeding of the 5,000. This is where Jesus performs a miracle, and uh, 5,000 people are fed with five loaves of bread and two small fish. So it was recorded that um, these fish were small, like these weren't no big old tuna fish the size of people. Uh, the, t <laughs> the text makes it very clear there were no trophies given for this fish. Like, they were small. We're talking about a kid's meal, right? So, um, reading uh, 625, it says, And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, You seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because the Father has set his seal on him. Then they said to him, Well, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered them and said, This is the work of God, that you believe in him who he sent. Therefore they said to him, what sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? Our fathers ate manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. 
Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. So just unpacking this for a bit. So after 5,000 people are fed, right, um, people are looking for him. They're like, hey, you know, it's free food. I'm there, you know. But Jesus calls them out before they can get two full sentences in, right? He says, don't hey, rabbi me. You know, <laughs> you don't care about me. You just want bread. And um, so here it is. Key, Jesus is offering the key to everlasting life. And all you care about is some Panera from heaven. Um, I can imagine them saying, like, you know, uh, we haven't heard of no bread called everlasting life. That sounds like a long time to make. Oh, I just, I wonder if he has focaccia. Ooh, I love focaccia. That's, that's what I love. You know, how are we going to get this bread? Um, so they, they tried to trick him. They tried to trick him to get bread. So you see in verse 25, they try to make small talk. Hey, buddy, how you doing? What you doing here? In uh, verse 28, they wanted to get all religious, you know, and say, oh, well, what shall we do to do the works of God? You know, and then in verse 31, they say, um, uh, give us this. Well, 31, he says, oh, uh, it's written, you know, he gave them bread from heaven to eat, you know. And that's the thing is, you know, you, you can't fool Jesus. You can't fool God. Um, you know, Jesus called them out directly from the beginning. He already knew what their motives were. And so let's, let's modernize this for a second, right? Like, what does that look like today? You know, w you know what does it look like to try to fool God? You know, you know what I'm talking about. You know, the folk that put on a good show, you know, that, uh, you know, act like they got it all together. They live by a checklist. You know, but let everybody know about it. Hey, hey, Pastor Rick, I went, I went to Bible study today. Praise the Lord. Hey, everybody, I went to Bible study. Or, or hey, I'm, I'm putting $100 in the plate, everybody. It, it, goes, it goes right here, you know. Or maybe, you know, people lifting holy hands and with one eye open to see who's looking. You know, oh, praise the Lord. Oh, yes, he is good to me, you know. But, um, but you know, what do we do all this for? You know, what is this, what is this bread taste like? Recognition, you know, status, fame, you know, so you could feel holy, you know, you, you can't fool God. You don't you don't do works to love God. You do works because you love God. But more than that, don't miss the mark. Don't settle for the bread. Let your hunger be for Jesus. Do you all see what I'm saying? OK. Um, if you don't know how to love him, just ask him. The Lord, Lord, how do I seek you? And he will tell you and believe that he'll answer you. I mean, it happened for Betsy. Like, Lord, how do I seek you? What do you want me to know? And he came right through for her. Um, Hebrews eleven six says, and it is impossible. Well, sorry. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he reward those who earnestly seek him. Short story, believe him and believe that when you seek him, he'll show up. Um, now, you know, Andrew, you said this sermon was about Peter. And so far, all we've been talking about is bread. So let's look, at, let's look at Peter as an example of how to love Jesus. So if we scroll down or flip to uh, the same chapter of John, and we go to verse 66, we'll start there. And it reads, From that time many dis disciples went back and walked with him no more. Then Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also want to go away? But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life and have and also we have come to believe and to know you are the Christ, 
the son of the living God. So just putting into context, um, people rolled out. <laughs> people just left Jesus, right? Um, you talking all that God talk, we don't want no, we, we don't want to hear that. We just want bread. Oh, you're not giving bread out? Okay, cool. We're gone, right? A lot of people left. So Jesus asked Peter and the other disciples, are y'all leaving too? Peter says, Lord, you have the words of eternal life. You got the keys to the kingdom. That's why I love me some Peter. <laughs> Peter recognized that there's more to Jesus than just surface level stuff when there's a relationship with him. Let's say it another way. Let's back up a little bit. Um, it's not like Peter didn't eat the bread from before, right? Don't get it wrong. Like, there's nothing wrong with eating the bread that we talked about or the bread that they wanted. Um, the point is that your hunger should be, your hunger for Jesus shouldn't stop at the bread, right? Peter knew that there was more to Jesus than just bread. So think of a relationship with Jesus like a Twinkie. <laughs> Twinkies have what? Outside bread and cream filling, right? The bread on the outside is synonymous with stuff that everybody gets, right? It's easy to get to and it's desirable. God has provided all that you have, believer or not, right? He wakes you up in the morning. He keeps the world spinning. He makes the uh, uh, sunshine on you, right? So what Jesus was trying to tell these other cats and what Peter picked up on is that there's more than just outside bread. You know, who doesn't want to have a relationship with one who can heal, direct, intercede, purify, justify, forgive, counsel, that can save your soul and so much more? Who doesn't want to have a relationship with someone like that? It's because most people don't believe that there is a cream filling. Some people believe that the outside bread is as sweet as it gets and then throws Jesus away. But Peter believed that the sweetness that, there wa that will be seen in this life will extend into eternity. If you remember those old hostess commercials from the 90s, Peter ate the bread and said, where's the cream filling? You know? He looked at Jesus and said, now that's the good stuff. Peter, Peter recognized the worth in having a relationship with Jesus. Peter knew this. And wasn't going anywhere. Loving God will get you the cream filling. The point that I'm trying to drive home is, love Jesus. There is a benefit that will change your life. So, at this point, um, if I was telling a story, the narrator would pause and ask a puzzling question, right? And then the TV screen would get all wavy and as we prepare for a flashback. <laughs> so I pose the question where, how did Peter come to love Jesus? So we're going to flash back and see what it is, how it is that he loved Jesus. So if we turn to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5, starting at verse 1. So it was as the multitudes pressed about him to hear the word of God, that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two boats standing by the lake, but the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let your net down for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish and their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. 
when Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so when James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon, and Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid, for now on you will catch men. So when they had brought their boats to land, they forsook all and followed him. So Jesus comes on the scene. So we're going to unpack this a little bit. So Jesus un comes on the scene and gets in Peter's boat, right? And Peter is there listening to him the whole time he's preaching. Listening to Jesus' teaching, listening to uh, the message. Then Jesus asked him, hey, let's just go out to the deep. Let's catch some fish. Peter says, look, man. I mean, I know you're preaching all, but like, look, I'm the fisherman. I'm trying to tell you that ain't no fish to be caught. We, we have labored all night. But because it is you, then I will do it. And then all the fish um, fill the net, right? So, that so, so much so that they ask for help, and then they still, all the boats are still sinking. Um, what I'm getting at is that those steps, right, Peter comes to know that Jesus is for real. And there was no doubt in his mind that um, who Jesus was. So then naturally he says, get away from me. I'm, I'm a sinful person. Like, you're holy. You're good. You're clean. You're awesome. I'm dirty. Please leave. So if we pause right now for a second, how many people see themselves in Peter's shoes? How many people are paralyzed and don't know how to love Jesus because they think the wrong things about themselves? How many people say, like, oh, God called me to do this and that, but I'm not good enough? Or God doesn't want anything to do with me? You see, that, that's the thing. None of us are good enough. That's the th thing about Jesus, is that when you rely on him, it's a blessing. We have him to rely on. You don't have to operate in your own strength. It's Jesus that does all the work. Look at what happened with Peter. Jesus is the one who told him where to lay the net. Jesus is the one who puts the fish in the net. All you got to do is throw the net. <laughs> your job is to be obedient. It's, it's, it's Jesus that does all the work. Don't let a poor image of self stop you from loving God. Now, you notice that Jesus didn't refute what Peter said about being sinful. But Jesus said, don't worry about it. You'll have a new purpose. Peter then responded. It doesn't say this, but I can imagine him saying this. You would look over my faults. You would look over my sin. You would look over my shame and still want to use me. You see, Jesus loved him first and Peter was paying attention. Peter can say, wow, that's love. I can get down with that. So Peter left everything for his love of Jesus. So. Think about this scenario for a second, like an ice cream truck going down a neighborhood. <laughs> and Jesus is the one that's driving it, right? Some people try to fix themselves up, right? You know, where you hear the, like little music or whatever, and then they, hey, the, the, the Messiah's here, the ice cream truck, the Messiah's here, and people just, oh, the Messiah's here, let me get myself together. Oh, oh, you know, oh, I'm, I gotta look good for the Messiah. Oh, he coming, he coming, yo. oh, I got a shower, oh, oh. Uh, Tell them, hold up. Tell them, hold up. You know, like <laughs> people try to look, try to get themselves together. But see, Peter was like, uh uh, nah, I ain't about to miss this truck. I don't care. Even if I smell like fish, I don't care. <laughs> I'm, I'm not missing this truck. 
I'm about to get my cream filling. <laughs> so this is the point. At this moment, Peter's greatest desire was Jesus and nothing else. That's how I believe that Peter came to love the Lord. Peter could have been flattered that God would want him and stop. Oh, wow, you want me, Lord? Oh, after all I do, that's great. But you see, I got this fishing business, and you just gave me a lot of fish, so I'm going to be all right for a little while. But see, Jesus was even more important than his career. So now I'm not trying to tell you to quit your job. <laughs> But God might, actually. Your job might be the thing that's keeping you from loving him. Peter made Jesus his greatest desire. Let us also make Jesus our greatest desire. All right. So now we're done with the flashback. Now we'll just go regular speed. <laughs> so we all know that it won't all good times and roses with Peter, right? <laughs> Peter made some mistakes. He didn't get everything right, right? Peter was always being corrected. But that's the thing. Jesus always kept him. He always held on to him. So let's look at a few. So in Matthew 14, we're not, we don't have to turn there. We're not going to read it, but just for reference. Matthew 14, Jesus is walking on water to meet up with some disciples or his disciples. Um, he has sent them ahead. And he was finishing up with crowd, and then he was praying to the Father. And he said, okay, go ahead, you know, y'all go ahead and take your boat to the other side. I'll meet up with you. Um, and then so later on in the night, Jesus is walking on water so that he can get to the boat. And everybody's like, whoa, what is this? You know, it's got to be a ghost because, you know, people don't do that. And then so Peter says, Lord, if it is you, tell me come out, and I'll come out. So Peter walks out on the water. Peter is on the water walking, but in the middle, he got scared. Rain, winds, you know, took his focus off, of, off the Lord. So Peter started sinking in the middle of a big lake. Peter could have died, but Jesus was there to pick him up. Um, so... Um, in John 18, Jesus is being betrayed by a man named Judas, who happened to be a disciple of Jesus's, right? Um, a bunch of guards show up to take him. And, you know, uh, Peter's like, you ain't taking my Jesus. I mean, I, I fell in love with this man. Like, you ain't going to just take him like this. So he sliced the guy, slices the guy's ear off. And, um, you know, thinking that, you know, it's a battle, um, trying to protect the Lord. But um, that's the thing. Jesus didn't do anything wrong, right? And they're taking him. So what do you think they're going to do to somebody who's cutting ears, you know? <laughs> so Peter was like, I mean, uh, Jesus was like, look, Peter, just put the sword away, right? He healed the guy's ear. And Jesus said, you're, you're here to take me. Just take me. Leave my disciples alone, right? Like, Jesus is right there, you know, fixing things for us. Same night, Peter is seen by other people, right? So Jesus is taken, right? And he's being um, under an unfair trial. He's being beaten. Um, and there are people that identify Peter. It's like, yo, hey, you were with Jesus, weren't you? He's like, no, nah, I wasn't. He's probably worried that he was going to be put on trial and killed, right? And he denies Jesus multiple times. But see, he denies Jesus out of his mouth, but he never denies Jesus out of his heart. And Jesus, therefore, never denied him. So, even, so Peter made mistakes, right? We all make mistakes. But did Peter give up? No. But isn't that how it's supposed to be? Isn't God bigger than our mistakes? You see, Peter learned from his mistakes, no, ba no matter how bad they were. Peter focused on, Peter's focus was not on his mistakes, right? 
his focus was on Jesus. So I guess what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that don't let your focus, don't get caught up in your mistakes. Let your focus be on the Lord. Um, all right, so let's look at another section on Peter. Um, we're going to look at John 21. So we're actually going to read this one. So at this point, um, Jesus has already died on the cross. He's paid our sin debt in full. He's risen from the dead. And now Jesus is making choice appearances before he goes back to heaven. So just like before, Jesus um, leads them to make another miraculous catch of fish. So let's read John 21, verse 1. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And in, the way, and in this way, he showed himself Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Canaan, or Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other of his disciples, they were all together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we're going with you also. They went out and immediately got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning had come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, children, you have any food? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast a net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast. And now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. Now, when Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it, and plunged into the sea. But the other disciples came, into the, came in the little boat, for they were not far from land, but about 200 cubits, dragging the net with fish. Then, as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals and fish laid on it and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish which you have caught. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land, full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many fish, the net was not broken. Jesus said to them, Come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? Knowing it was the Lord. Jesus then came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and likewise the fish. Now, this is now the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after, after he was raised from the dead. Um, so unpacking this, um, Peter plunges into the sea, right? Hey, it's the Lord. Peter plunges into the sea. Well, why didn't he just wait? <laughs> you know? Um, Everybody else is rowing. Like, the logical thing would be to row the boat to shore. But see, even after denying him, even after denying Jesus, Peter still had a childlike zeal for Jesus. But do you see what happened? Just like in Luke chapter 5, Jesus brings Peter back to a familiar place where he first received Christ. You see, Peter went back fishing. That's what he was doing before he met Jesus. And then Jesus performs the same miracle again, right? And I can just imagine Peter's eyes being open, like, wow, you know? And then he immediately plunges into, in, into the water to swim. And as he's swimming, I can imagine him saying, imagine him remembering Jesus getting into the boat like last time. And, and listening to the sermon preached, as he's swimming and swimming and swimming, he's, he's remembering the, how gracious Jesus was to him and the, the amazing catch of fish that he had received before. He's continuing to swim and he's saying, there's no shame, there's no condemnation that can keep me from Jesus. 
He's remembering his new purpose in Christ. He steps on to shore. I can imagine that this is God's way of telling Peter, boy, get away from that boat and give me a hug. <laughs> right? Like, you're not supposed to be fishing. You're supposed to be with me. So sometimes God has to call you back to where you first met him to remind you why you chose him and what you left behind and why you left it. So the thing here to notice is that Jesus is our source of love. Jesus is the source of our love for him. He's just inviting you into it. He's inviting you into something great. So if we continue to read at verse 15, it says, So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, some translations will say John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him again, a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Peter knows that he loves Jesus. But see, now he's confessing it. You see, there's power in confessing your love for Jesus. There's healing in professing your love for Jesus. So I asked the Lord, why is Peter listed first out of all the disciples? It's because Peter loves him. Jesus knew that Peter would take care of his ministry. When you love somebody, you're going to take care of their stuff. Jesus says, Peter, I know you love me. Take care of my sheep while I'm gone. You see, here, Peter in the beginning was a man that thought he was too sinful for the Lord's work, but is now being handed the ministry that Jesus started. If you keep reading on in Acts, right, Jesus takes over, I mean, Peter takes over Jesus' ministry, right? Peter preaches the gospel. He heals people. He raises the dead. And in the process, just the first couple of chapters, 5,000 souls are led to Christ. That's what happens when you love the Lord. That's the cream filling. The cream filling is the proof on earth of what is to come in heaven. We need to be in deeper relationship with the Lord. We don't have to, but we need to. You can never get enough of the Lord. So let's recap. Look at Peter's life as an example of a man who loved Jesus. Don't let a poor self-image stop you from loving Jesus. To love Jesus is to make him our greatest desire. Learn from your mistakes. Jesus is the source of our love for him. Love the Lord. There is a benefit that will change your life. And enjoy the cream filling. Enjoy the work that God will do through you and the treasure that he'll give you when you meet him face to face. If you all remember Romans 8.28, it takes a whole new meaning when you look at it through Peter's lens, right? And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Have you been called? AKA, have you placed your faith in Jesus? So 
I'll just give a quick testimony. How are we on time? Okay. All right. I'll give a quick testimony. So this is how good God is. So Rick didn't know this, but God told me in January that I'd be preaching on Peter. Rick asked me in March to prepare for today. My wife told me yesterday, today is Pentecost, which is a festival that celebrates the descent and the filling of the Holy Spirit on Peter and the others. This is where Peter preached his first sermon and about 3,000 souls were saved. Can't make that up. So I'm convinced that God handcrafted this message especially for you. I don't know who, but he's calling you. Don't let the ice cream truck go by. You don't have to get yourself ready. Just come as you are. So I guess if we could all stand. Um, if you're here today and you haven't placed your faith in Jesus and you want to give your life to Christ, just take a moment and pray this prayer with me. Say, God, I know that I'm a sinner and I have made mistakes. Forgive me, God, because I know that only you can forgive sins. I believe that your son, Jesus Christ, died for my sins. And I fully accept him as my savior. Come into my life and put me in right relationship with you. So that I may be with you for all eternity. And just like that, you can now convene with Jesus. And for those that are believers, and for those that love God, or for even those that have a hard time loving God, you see there's a hymn that comes to mind. You see, I know that Peter didn't write this hymn but I could easily see that the hymn being easy for him to sing, right? There's a, there's a hymn that talks about the, hearing the name of Jesus and how sweet it is. The, the, the hymn that says it sounds like music to my ears. If, if it were Peter, it would be the, it, this is the music, his name is what makes me drop everything. His name is what makes me plunge into the water to get to him, right? And it, said, and it talks about how, oh, how I love Jesus because he first loved me. So if you can sing with me this, confess your love for Jesus. If you're having a hard time, then confess your love for Jesus. This is a, this is a way of, getting rid of all the guilt, all the shame. You just let Jesus take care of it. You put your focus on him. The hymn goes like this. It says, there is a name I love to hear. I love to hear this word. It sounds like music in my ear the sweetest name on earth oh how i love jesus oh how i love jesus oh how I love Jesus because he first loved me. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus 
because he first loved me. So, I pray that this week that you be blessed. I pray this week that you love Jesus. I pray that this week that he allows you to be in a position where he and you can commune, commune together. I pray that your focus would be on him. I pray in Jesus' name that there would be wisdom for you for how to seek him and that he would tell you. I pray for protection that the enemy would have no foothold, no root, nothing should come against you. And I pray that anything that is on you that is not of him would be broken in Jesus' name and sent to his cross, Lord, to be dealt with. I pray for provision that in any way that you are to convene with him, Lord, that you would just provide a way that there would be babysitters and that there would be time off or the, that there would be even money if needed. Lord, that there would just be provisions in order for you, that there would be nothing distracting you and that you'd be able to love Jesus. We thank you, Lord, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.